Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. You merely adopted retro. I was born in it. Welcome everyone to April 1982, and this is where we left off playing Saga, the Adventure Land number one. And we need to go back because we got some that work now. For starting with the Probe 1, the transmitter on the Atari home computer. This one, we it was another disc that was not correct. So there's several copies that you can find out there, and it's just some of them don't work. But here we go. Let's play some Probe 1, the transmitter for the Atari home computer by Lloyd D. Allman Jr. And Synergistic Software is the publisher. What will Probe 1, the transmitter, be like? And so like we did before, I'm going to fast forward through the beginning and then they're going to ask us for reaction time because this is in the past. We've seen games where they say the reaction time on how fast you type in something for an enemy that shows up or uh, something involved with the text adventure game. So I'm going to go ahead and do one for the slowest reaction time because we don't know exactly what to expect. And then I'll do joystick instead of paddle controls. And then it says we have a stun gun and a translator, most likely to translate the alien language. I'm guessing. All right. So let's fast forward again through this section. The disc is not corrupted. It actually goes the way it's supposed to. Okay, so we're in the game and we're in the antechamber. There's a door to the south. So we're in this room. So if you want to go anywhere, if I type G for go, it automatically types go. And then I say south, it automatically does south. So it already knows what to do to go to a different room. And it's almost doing like we saw with App Venture to Atlantis. Some quality of life where you don't have to type the whole thing in. All right, so same thing with L. Yeah, it does look. Don't, don't have to type the whole thing. So there's look. There's an object on the floor. Okay, look. Floor. It appears to be a pair of goggles. Okay, works. And then if we want to get that, I'm guessing take or get. Yep, I just type T and take works. Goggles. Wow. A fresh new take on the adventure genre. Okay, so that is there. And anything else we can do here? Looks like there's still a door to the south. I just type L for look and, oh, object in the corner. Look corner. It appears to be a black crystal. All right, so we'll get that one. Pick that up. Take crystal. Now, I haven't tried anything past the two-word text parser, but what in the world's going on here? A drone attack. All right, so I'm holding my Atari. What in the world? It. Now we're back in the antechamber. We were attacked by guard drones and returned to this room. Okay, so look. For a brief second there, I picked up the Atari VCS joystick that's plugged in, and it was moving the uh, object. I thought it was an object in the room, but it moved the object left and right. All right, nothing of interest here. Let's go south. Does that mean they took our laser? Oh, there it is. We got it. Look. Objects on the floor. Look floor. It's our gun. So it's where we dropped it. All right, we'll take that. Pick that one back up. There we go. We got our gun. Oh, sweet. Okay, so this is a bizarre treat. This is the text adventure game or graphic adventure game where I can move the joystick and I'm playing a fixed shooter. Does the red button work? Oh, it does. So I have my gun now and I can actually shoot so that the alien shows up. We'll know what to do. Okay, so let's go. Oh, actually, no, I see another crystal in the corner. Don't go. Uh, look, I bet it's in the corner again, right? Corner, because we, I guess we dropped everything we picked up. Yeah, there's the black crystal again. All right, so let's try it again without being attacked. So this is the first time we played a uh, text adventure game that is just interrupting us with an enemy shooting us. Uh, pretty cool idea. All right, let's take that crystal. This serves no purpose. What? Taking the crystal isn't? All right, do I have to tape, say black crystal? Black crystal. Ah, oh, it is more than two word text parser. Okay, I'm impressed. Let's go south now. So very bizarre. This is, <laughs> oh, there he is. Get him. <laughs> I'm going from keyboard controls and then I go quick to the Atari joystick and then pl uh, get the joystick in my hand to shoot, shoot the alien. Crazy. Okay, let's go east through the open door. So we're making our way around the area. So now we're in a storeroom. So let's do look again. Pretty cool. It's a combination adventure game, straight up adventure game, graphic adventure game, and a shooter. 
never seen that one before. All right, it looks like we probably can't go to the front. So if I say go north, it'll say what? It's blocked, right? Oh, it does work. Yeah, we're in the next room. Okay, it looks like a phone's hanging on the wall. I'm using some imagination because you never know for sure. All right, let's look in this one. Anything in this room? Nope, nothing of interest here. Okay, so let's go north. There are two doors, though. How does it know which one to pick? All right, so let's go again to the west. I don't know what that means. That sounds bad. What does this mean? We're in the reception room and the door's at the south. So go... You've just fallen down an inactive... Oh, okay. We fell down a shaft. Gotcha. Okay, let's go north. So maybe we're in the next part of the quote-unquote sci-fi dungeon. Okay, it's where we started. Go south. All right, so this is another game that I couldn't find a, a perfect walkthrough for. Every time you start the game, it's in a different place. Or they, uh, they don't plop you in the same thing every time. It also depends on what difficulty or reaction time you select. So you're going to see a different experience or a slightly different every time you play. All right, so let's go south again. But you can see quality of life with the text adventure game. Don't have to type the whole words in, which is nice. This is the utility room. Okay, so I'd say uh, this is definitely better than I thought it would be. Probe 1, the transmitter, is not your average game. Um, from what I've read in reviews at the time, it was just short. People said it wasn't as, uh, a very lengthy game. So I'm still going to go three and a half stars for Probe 1, the transmitter. Excellent idea, interesting, and they're also doing more than we've seen in, in graphic adventure games for the time. So check it out. And we also have another one. Last episode, we couldn't play Rescue from Newfon, And now, again, I found a, a good cassette tape, plus a scan over on the left side of what the box looked like. This is by Newfcop. Let's take a look at Rescue from Newfon, popping in the cassette on our Commodore VIC-20 in April of 1982. After we played Dark Forest on the Apple II and the game didn't load, I never went back to play that game, but then we saw reference after reference of Dark Forest by Sirius Software on lots of games. And it kind of makes me now, whenever we go through this on the live stream, if something really doesn't work, I want to make sure it does because later on it could show up or we, we would, I would want to see it because Dark Forest still is one of those games that I wish we could play. It's apparently a, a slightly st strategy uh, slash fantasy game at the same time, but still have not played that one, even though we've seen it referenced probably five or six times in other games. All right, there we go. Newfcop Software presents Rescue from Newfon. It even has the um, uh, accent at the top, like Newfcop. It's loading again. So after the loading, it loads it in the second time. Well, pretty standard for using a cassette at the time in 1982. Can't believe that. Can you imagine? Well, right now, we're, we're trying to experience what it would be like in 1982 to play these games. And a lot of people don't want to touch the computer games because of the loading. It takes too long. And, and when you're using mediums like cassette or the um, uh, old school disc players, it, it just it, it's not as practical. And it's, it's, it's more cumbersome. So thankfully, we got this. So I'm going to fast forward. There we go. Finally. So we're in the game now. Here is Nufam. All right. So this is our character in the center. I think that's our character. All right. So I'm going to say S, E, okay, East, South, West. Okay. So we're a yellow character. Terrible color scheme. It does not mesh well. Who is that? Am I, am I on the screen or not? Oh, so if I go north and I touch this person... I think that's me rescuing one of our comrades. And then someone's moving around, so I'm going to push F to fire. Okay, so I'm just randomly trying different things on the keyboard because we didn't have a manual, didn't have the back of the box. It's using controls similar to Dungeon Quest, or I should say uh, Star Quest, where you move around with the cardinal direction. So uh, let's say I want to go south into the next room. Oh, F for fire, quick. And it's going to use energy every time I move and every time I fire, <laughs> almost like taking tropes from E.T., which we haven't seen yet. E.T. doesn't exist. But every time you move, you're going to get weaker and weaker every single time. Yes, that's why I love the cartridges on uh, computers. We played uh, VIC-20, you know, just pop it into your computer. And then the TI-99 cartridge based, so much fun. Um, okay, let's keep going south here. And okay, I can hold the button down and go farther. Okay, let's go east. Got someone else to rescue. And we have only so much energy, so I think this is... Pretty much the bread and butter, butter of the game. I thought it would be a little more interesting, like a adventure-type style game. All right, we'll go north to the next room. Hit F for fire. Yeah, so you can see attack and dodging really isn't it, non-existent. But controls, though, don't use the joystick. So I was first wiggling around thinking we could use the Commodore VIC-20. But why, why didn't they use it? It'd be a lot, a lot better experience. 
All right, so we're rescuing more people, which I'm assuming I'm rescuing them. I touch them, they change color. It makes sense. Let's go to the north. We got a rescue from Nufon. And I'm already lost. I was not drawing the maze. Fire. No one there. West. Let's go over to the left side now. Okay, so that's a pretty small maze, actually, if it's only this. Let's go south now. Branching off to the west again. Fire. And south. So it looks like it's more of not an action-based game. It's more of a, a conservation of energy. Like, can you get through this and rescue everyone within before your energy runs out? You know, uh, conserving ammo and so forth. Because uh, there's no aim. All I do is hit F, and then you fire the blaster, just like in StarQuest. All right, so there's Rescue from Nufon. So another one, we get to re-rate. I'd say um, th this one's actually pretty pretty standard for the typical game you see at the time. Th this is a, a pretty fun time. I wouldn't say above average, just because um, we've seen other games specific for the home computer on Atari, like by Crystalware, that take this to a whole nother level, adding role-playing elements, lots of other things that make the game more interesting. So I'll still say three stars for Rescue from Nufon. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing particularly good about it either. All right, so we last left off on Adventureland, and now let's press forward and see our next game. In April of 1982, we got Sargon II, the long-awaited sequel of Sargon Chess for the Atari home computer. Let's take a look at the box for Sargon II, the official sponsor of the U.S. Chess Open. So is this the, the chess game that you would want to play in 1982 by Dan and Kathy Spracklin? Way to go, Dan and Kathy. We flip it over in the back, and Hayden... Uh, is this Hayden Software? Hayden Software Company advertising their other games, which are all board games. Go, Reversal, and King Cribbage. For all those board game aficionados out there, it says hours and hours of enjoyment if you love playing chess. Oh, wow, for computer tournaments? Now, I remember when the first one came out, we uh, played it with one of my friends on the channel for a guest, and I told him how impressive it was or how the artificial intelligence was for the game. And because all guests rate the game, he just said, all right, five stars for Sargon 1. Let's see what Sargon 2 is like. So there's another ad for Sargon 2 along with a few other games. Uh, some arcade in there too, not just board games. And there is a scan of the five and a quarter floppy disk. Looks like we need 16K, only 16K for Sargon 2. Okay. And we even have the manual. Very helpful when you want to play chess. Now we played chess on, on consoles and even the Atari home computer that uses the joystick. So this is another one on the Atari home computer. I want to see how they control it. Oh, Sargon 2 represents a significant evolution from the original Sargon chess program. Changes to make the program easier, more convenient to use, offer a much tougher computer opponent. So all for, for those pros out there that are tired of the boring chess game and you want to go for something difficult, here you go. You got the desk, uh, disc or tape version. Oh, wait a second. It says in the manual, you'll need the Atari 800 XL computer. Now, this is the first reference of the XL that we've ever seen. I wonder if this is a later revision of the manual. Uh, memory serves the Atari 800 XL, I think, was summer of this year. Mm, but uh, don't quote me on that one. All right, so how do we load it? We'll skip by the loading instructions. How do we play? When we begin the game, they're going to ask us questions, and we just answer those with a keyboard. Choose a new game if we want to be black or white. Level of play, how difficult you want it, and then uh, response time. Looks like, oh, is this how long you can take your turn? Uh, Sargon takes more time. Okay, yeah. So whenever you do more difficult scenarios, if you do like level six, it could take four hours for the move, three times the chart time. Wow. That's talking about going to make a sandwich. Four hours. I guess you do your move and then go to bed and then let the computer make its turn after that. So here's the board. The chess board. A through H and numbers for the uh, rows, letters for the columns. And then how do you... Oh, it is not joystick controlled. You have to enter your move with where it's going to go from and to, which we've seen this on home computers starting in the 70s and even mainframe. You put in, you know... Uh, uh, D6 to D7, you know, you, you put in the, the command that you want. So this is another one you're putting the command in. And then hit return, and then how do you castle? Enter the king's move followed by return. Yeah, so it's it's all no, not joystick controlled. It is only keyboard to play Sargon 2. And then this one has a few things like it gives you uh, hints and tips. 
you can put in like a, a an asterisk and it'll show a hint of where you should possibly move your piece. And it even has audio signals, music. Well, not music. It's more like sound effects to tell you if you if you're doing well or not. Yeah, there is the blinking asterisk beside the PLY assures you that Sargon 2 is in fact thinking, has not fallen asleep. The move listed next to the asterisk is the best move that Sargon 2 has found at this point. So there you go. If you wanted to play a good chess game, this might be it. Just have an alternate version there. Let's pop on the disc and play Sargon 2 at the beginning of April 1982 by Hayden Software. We've already played a lot of chess. A lot of video chess. So I, it'd be hard to tell because unless you're a skilled chess player and you you take the program on its turns and you want to be uh, challenging like uh, like you mentioned L. Curtis B they had a competition with this one Sargon 2 has music it isn't just sound effects it is loop over and over again but we take whatever music we can in 1982 do we want to have a new game yes we do pushing G for new game we'll go starting with white level of play uh, I don't want to wait forever for a turn so let's do two just so it doesn't go crazy Okay, here we go. This is the board. Now, we played some games on chess. They sh actually show you the rows and columns. This does not. So you have to know, either go to the manual to know where to move a piece. So let's see if I do, uh, is it D2 to D4? Okay, so I just did that one on memory. And you can see I did my white piece move, then the computer did their, their, their piece move. So if I do B2 to B4... Yeah, there you go. So it's moving the pieces, but you have no reference. You have to either know automatically the uh, column and grid uh, to, to type in or refer to the manual. So uh, very, very rough. <laughs> Someone should, right? You make chess bloody, then it'll uh, probably sell more. I don't even know if People Pong was a real thing because I come across games. <laughs> I don't know if People Pong was a published game or not for sure. It uh, looks like it's doing its move. That took a lot longer, though. But yeah, if you want to make it more interesting, you could. This one is um, uh, mentioned in what I saw in reviews, the the quality chess game where you're going to get the uh, very good intelligence, especially for the Atari home computer. So I'd say for all the games we've seen up to this point, if you're a chess aficionado, this is a um, a very good game. But I'm going to I'm going to say just average because of having to type in instead of using a joystick to control. So I'll say three stars for Sargon Two, Sargon Two. But that's not all. We also have Sargon Two Chess for the Commodore VIC-20. It's all that chess, but on the Commodore VIC-20. Let's take a look at the box. This one is a totally different box than the other one. One of the most sophisticated computer chess programs ever written turns your VIC-20 into a challenging chess partner with seven play levels, board setup, and color options. But does it use a joystick like the other games we played? Yes. And our little mascot for Commodore VIC-20 says, turn your VIC-20 into a computer chess partner. Thanks, buddy. Teach yourself chess. Now, I think this one is two-player. If you notice, that the Atari version didn't have two-player. It just said, you ready to play? All right, you're playing against the computer. What level do you want? There's the example of the cartridge we're going to be popping in. The cartridge. And we have the manual for Sargon 2 Chess for the VIC-20. Yes, the VIC-20 version of Sargon 2 Chess. Oh, more lengthy, more impressive possibly than the Atari, which is so bizarre. They have really good chess programs on Atari Home Computer already. <laughs> They're going to give us a history of chess. Thanks, guys. How do you get started adjusting screen position? There it is, eliminating screen flutter. If that really was a problem, is that why the Commodore 64 gets so popular later? Because every single manual we've seen on the Commodore VIC-20 says, if you got screen flutter, here's how you fix it. Be terrible to play that way. All right, starting and ending of the game, how do you start a new game? It's going to ask us again the questions we want, what color, level of play. Does it have one or two players, though? Screen display. It doesn't show here. Moving pieces around. Now, if it... Oh, okay, so moving pieces using joystick. What? It has the cursor that moves around the screen, it says. Picking up the chess piece. Whoa, okay, so this one is more impressive than the Atari. It, it does use a joystick, it looks like. No way. And then all the different sound effects, what they mean, hint for beginners or kibitz. Kibitz not designed to work at level zero. Okay. All right. So that's, yeah, this is a lot more. We're only halfway through the manual. That's more impressive, I would say, than the uh, the uh, Atari version. Okay. So we just have different alternate versions there. Let's pop in that cartridge and play Sargon 2 Chess. 
in the beginning of April 1982. Again, by Dan and Kathleen Spracklin. So they did something different. They, they did the port for this as well. So here we go. I want to push F1 to start. Do we want the game? We do. Now, wait. I mean, push F. I want to see setup. Does setup allow two people? Oh, no. Setup allows you to move the pieces around. Okay. I gotcha. All right, let's go back. I want to see if it was two player, but it looks like it's not. This is still one player only. All right, hitting F1 to start. We want G for game. We want to play white. We'll do skill level two again. And we're in. Oh, look at that. Big 20 joystick works. Do we do that? Oh, nice. What? Invalid move. Why is that invalid? It wouldn't let me go two? What's going on? Pawns can go... Oh, wait, maybe I... I no, I, I'm, I'm sure something's going on there. <laughs> oh, that's true. Archon is going to be coming out uh, very shortly. They can make Archon bloody, I'm sure. All right, so he moved his knight out already. Let's see. Can I move this out? Why is this not going forward? Okay, it did work. But this is it. It's a Sargon 2. We have still one player only, but it has the option of the VIC-20 joystick to work. How crazy is that? Why would you put a game on the Atari home computer, but the Atari VCS joystick doesn't work for chess? That's what you should have done. Now, I'm in the position, though, we... Uh, from what I've been told for reviews, this is a very sophisticated chess program. Very, very good chess program. But how good is the mileage for, like, video game-wise? If it's something you're looking for, like, what would be the best chess program, this is possibly one of the best chess video games you could play for the time. I'm actually going to bump this one up. Compared to what we played on the Atari, this one also had, not only did it use the joystick, but it had the grid if you wanted to type in showing you the column and row. So you didn't have to look at the manual to guess. Yeah, so I'm going to say, because it's Sargon 2, and because of how impressive of a chess game it is, I'm going to go four stars. Because this is one of the best chess games you could be playing at the time, on a computer. I'll say four stars. Yeah, that's true. It, it's, it's, it's like genres. Which, what's your genre that you want to play? Do you, do, do you want to only look at shooters or space games? Do you want to only look at strategy games? And there's going to be aficionados that which one's going to be the better one. So at this point, Sargon 2 is one of the best, so I'm going to say four stars. No genre is safe here on Chronologically Gaming. All right, so let's press forward and see our next game. We're still on the Commodore VIC-20. Let's go to Europe and play Search and Destroy. Another one without a box, just a screenshot. Let's pop it and play Search and Destroy. This is by Ray Mitchell. Way to go, Ray. Published by The Wizard's Magic Toy Box. Wait, is this an educational title if it's The Wizard's Magic Toy Box? Another one we're going to play on tape. Fast forwarding right on through that. That's the way to go. And then pressing the key on the keyboard. Oh, nice transition. Press any key for level 1 or F1 for level 2. Well, let's just push any key. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a battleship video game. Where do you want to place your ships? Uh, how about G4? I do not have any joystick control, so it's almost like we're playing chess again with the grids and rows. Let's do H7. But here's the thing. It didn't say one or two players. So if I'm playing against the computer, this is not going to be fair at all. They're going to definitely sink my battleship. Four, eight. So I'm just putting mine down. Now your turn. Wait, player? Computer? Wait, I can do the player? Let's see. F. Two. Oh, it is. It's only against the computer. No. So this means that when you play the game, there is no one, one person against another. But I guess that'd be difficult to do. We played other strategy games where the computer says, you know, the other person leaves the room. Or cover your eyes or something, and then the other person can come back in after they place their pieces. But yeah, this wouldn't work. Battleship would be a difficult one to translate to a home computer. But I mean, come on. How am I going to guess and play against a computer? They're going to wipe the floor with me. Let's do E4. Yep, and they already blown me up. Yeah, no way. I bet the difficulty is insane. They know exactly where we placed everything. <laughs> That's true. When you play the battleship, those pieces always went everywhere. All right, so that, that's, that's a good point. When I, uh, I was bashing other board games, or we, if we could play the game somewhere else, why would you make it a video game? I made that comment in the past, and people would uh, tell me, well, what, what about all the other parts or pieces or the calculations they did? Now it's like, it's true. The computer is doing something, so you don't have to get the board out and all the pieces. So that's a very good point. All right, so I'll say for Search and Destroy, though, 
uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say bad because th playing against a computer where they are they should already know where your battleship is. It's not gonna be a very fun experience. So two stars for search, search and destroy. It's not the last battleship video game, that's for sure. Let's press forward and see our next game. All right, our next game is still on the Commodore VIC-20. This is Subtraction. This was the two-parter. We had Lighthouse, which we saw a little bit a while back, and then now Subtraction. It's an educational title. If you look on the left, that's the gameplay that I'm only going to show. Subtraction is you take the two quadrants and you subtract the numbers, and then you have to type in or get the number in of the answer quick as you can to destroy the ship that's in the middle. Uh, middle. All right, so Subtraction, uh, we're going to say one star because it's just typing in or answering the equation. I'm sure it gets the job done for an educational game, but uh, for the purposes of this channel, I'm saying one star. All right, so let's press forward and see our next game. He's only three. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is the TI-99-4A. This one is a doozy of a game. He's only three, and already he's reaching out, seeking and looking to you to point the way. Now is when a Texas Instruments home computer can give him a real head start. With more educational cartridges than any other computer, they challenge, encourage, make learning fun. The home computer from Texas Instruments. Don't put it off. Oh, yeah, don't you dare put that off. That uh, You need to get the computer now because your son needs to learn. If you don't get the computer, he won't learn anything. If, after they kicked Cosby to the curb selling the TI-99, then they just really tug at your heartstrings now on the Texas Instrument ads. Oh, man. So this one, uh, besides the ad, uh, the game we're playing is Tunnels of Doom, which uh, that little kid definitely is going to play. This one is a crazy game, very ambitious for the time. Uh, really excited to show it to you. I almost didn't show it to you because how difficult it is to load. So let's take a look at Tunnels of Doom. Starting with the box. This one is, just like the other ones by Texas Instruments, looks like it's an application rather than a game. <laughs> yeah, so if you flip it over the back, you're about to enter a labyrinth of tunnels and rooms where all the myriad realms of fantasy coexist to challenge all would-be heroes with the Tunnels of Doom solid-state software command module and one of the many cassette or disc-based games you can enter into a journey beyond your imagination. Two games are included, Pennies and Prizes and Quest for the King. They're included in the module. Use the Tunnels Tunnels of Doom package requires an audio cassette recorder on the TI disc memory system sold separately. It adds, oh, you need 30, I think it's 36K is what you need, but there's the cassette. Uh, if you were using cassette, it also takes disc, but the main thing is the cartridge. You're going to be plugging in the cartridge to play this. <laughs> yeah, what? Oh, don't hit that key. Oh, the kid just erased all my tax files. All right, so we also have the manual for Tunnels of Doom. And if you notice, the manual itself is the inside sleeve. So the box is a see through well, not a see-through box. It has a hole in the box, and then this sleeve you pull out, and there, there's the manual for you. Now, this reference guide is big. Uh, there's a lot to this game, so I'm not going to go through or touch everything, but Tunnels of Doom is a, a, a very big fantasy role-playing game. It's uh, not up there with Ultima and Wizardry. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty close. If you think about the mechanics whenever you see this game being played. <laughs> Man, that commercial, I want to keep playing that one for every Texas instrument because, I mean, wow. They're, they're really milking the, your children really need the Texas Instruments computer. If you don't get it for them, then what are they going to do? They, they, they won't have any hope. No hope at all. So first page is a quick reference guide telling you all the functions, and man oh man, this has a lot of different functions. Check out movement. Movement is E, S, D, and X. If you have a keyboard and you look down, on the Texas instrument, it's like the uh, like a, a small version of the arrow keys. And then everything you want to do something, you have to use the function key with letters. So you need to actually be, get, this manual should be by your, your side unless you're used to playing Tunnels of Doom. So that's the first part, is just when you're in the game, how to actually play it. Uh, and, and make the uh, make, make the controls work correctly. This is designed by Kevin Kinney. Way to go, Kevin. This one is an impressive video game for 1982. You're about to take your first step into the unknowns of the Tunnels of Doom, where all the myriad realms of fantasy coexist to challenge all would-be heroes. Now, this manual is pretty lengthy. 
It tells you how to play Tunnels of Doom, how to load Tunnels of Doom. The, one, of, one of the reasons I wasn't going to showcase this one is I could not get this to play. You have to get the cartridge and plug the cartridge in, and I thought I was all set. But no, Tunnels of Doom doesn't take just the cartridge. You have to have also the cassette and disc, and I could not find it. I had to uh, search online for forums, and because... I just recently figured out how the game would run. I was gonna, I was actually just gonna show the artwork and then move on. But uh, just today, I figured out how to make this run. It's gonna be really fun. All right, so there's the other commands you can do: player status, firing range weapons, showing the map, negotiating monsters during the battle, trading items between players, and then this is the setup. How do you actually get this game to go? You have to plug the car uh, pop the cartridge in the slot first. After you get the slot in, do you have a, the cassette? version or the disc version. So you also have the have the drive on your TI-99 for disc or cassette. And then after you get those in, uh, does it explain how to load the game? It does. Okay, so yeah. Then it explains over on this side how to get the game on because you have to load it from cassette and then also type in the correct file. Oh, man. And then it has the vocabulary section telling us what everything is. What's hit points, Daddy? What are those for? So let's move on to the next... Uh, section because there's two games built in. One of them is Pennies and Prizes. This is the Tunnels of Doom game designed for children and demonstration purposes. It's comprised of one to four floors, eight quests, and objects to find like quests. For the king, the dungeon has no monsters, no uh, no weapons, or magical items. So it's just moving around the dungeon for children, like the little kid from the commercial, I guess. Before you begin, uh, follow the directions on how to set everything up, and then when you get to the screen, you have to type the word Pennies in to load the Pennies and Prizes game mode. And this game mode is very introductory. It's borderline role-playing. It's more of just moving around the maze. You find prizes, and uh, what is it? You explore the dungeon looking for eight quest objects. A puppy, a snail, a parakeet, a fishbowl, a pitcher, a top, a stardust, and a magic glass. No time limit. Just take your time, walk around, and find all the prizes. And then when you find all eight of them, that's it. That's all it is. So no monsters at all. So we are not playing that game mode even though we were just advertising a little kid playing the Texas Instruments computer. We'll be playing Quest for the King. This one is uh, the sample quest. When you load the game, you... Um, and, and actually, when you load the game, you can make your own uh, role-playing party and build uh, a, a great game from, from the, uh, the Quest for the King mode. What we're going to be doing is using what they already have in the Quest for the King mode. You can just say Continue Current Game, and then you start in the two-story dungeon... Easiest level of difficulty, and you are assigned a party of three. You can't have a party of four, but we're going to do the, the default mode. And what's cool about this manual is it breaks down how to play that mode. It says your player one is Eric Seablade. Eric Seablade. He's in blue, and he's a fighter armed with a sword, shield, and leather armor. And it's telling you these people have already been made, so you don't have to make them yourself. Also helpful for us on the stream, because then we don't have to build the whole party of characters and then go play the role-playing game. So after you start the sample quest, your party members appear in the room of the dungeon, and then the general store appears at once, and you can start buying things. But you already have fully stocked players, so they just explain how to buy some rations. After you buy rations, then you back out of the store, and then it tells you you need to go to the next level and work your way down through the dungeon. And after you go down to the dungeon, then it starts the first-person perspective mode, and that's where this game gets really interesting. Not only is it first-person like a Calabeth and Ultima when you're in the dungeon... It is the very first video game, to my knowledge, that is mapping out the map. So when you go hit, hit M, you can actually have a, a live map being created for you and drawing in where you've been and where you where you need to go next. It's the very first time when you look at the map, it actually says, here's where you've been and here's where you haven't been. Very, very helpful. They should be incorporating more of those, right? All right, so whenever you go to different rooms, there's chances of random encounters while you're walking around. And they're going to uh, they explain those and how those work. But the reason why you need the manual is even the scenario that's built into the game, it's, it's, bre it's breaking down all the steps you need to take because that's how complicated the game is. It, it's, it's more complicated I'd say, or maybe the same level, close to the same level as Wizardry. And uh, also the disc or the cassette you have, you're going to be saving your progress on that one. Okay, so let's keep continue down a little bit further. Then they break down um, after you do the normal scenario. Yeah, the, so this is the step-by-step -step process of w the scenario that, that is built in the game. And then they say, if you want to play from scratch, the object of Quest for the King is rescue the king before he's eliminated. 
He's being held captive by monsters in the dark unknowns of the dungeon under a ruined castle. You must also retrieve the king's rainbow orb of power before it's destroyed. Beware, your time is limited. So there's also a timer involved on this one. Every step you take, they're faced with perils of the dungeon. Monsters lurk in hallways and guard treasures. You have to fight off attacks and find treasures as possible, uh, as possible to help you succeed in your quest. And then how do you prepare? So this one break, breaks down if you're not doing the normal mode to build your party, buy everything you need to, and then begin the quest. And then they, they, they talk about how you play the game uh, as usual. And this is only halfway through the manual. Th this is a, oh, a sprawling role-playing game. So much fun if you wanted to play a role-playing game in 1982. I guess before Ultima 2 comes out, this would be the other big heavy hitter at the time. All right, so with that, let's pop in the cartridge and uh, buckle your seats to play some Tunnels of Doom. He's only free. In 1982, by Kevin Kinney. In the beginning of April, 1982. <laughs> okay, so because I just learned how to make this work, I usually have scripts that run everything behind the scenes so we can get to the game faster, but now you get to see everything that's going to happen so we can get the game to run. So bear with me a sec. We first need to make sure we have 32K memory, and we need to have the disk system plugged in and then we reset now that we got the disc plugged in now we have to pop the disc in to the uh, to the disc uh tape and now that the disc is in the tape we want it read write and we reset now we are ready all the hardware set up we're gonna play some tunnels of doom press any key to begin and press two for tunnels of doom That's, a, that's how you start a role-playing game right there. Okay, so let's do two. We're loading from disk, and we're playing the quest file on the disk. All this to make the game even boot up. Imagine all the hardware you have to spend on that. All right, so this is where you could choose to build a new dungeon, which means create your own characters or continue the current game. We're going to do continue because it automatically gives us our characters. There they are. And automatically goes into the general store. We're going to go ahead and buy some rations. Because we already got all our weapons and armor we need. Purchased. And then you need proc C. Which you need to know the command for that too. To, to leave the, 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 the store. And a lot of the stuff they say. They're going to say end. They're going to say redo. They, they have different things. They say type this key. The only way you'd know that is if you have a Texas Instruments computer in front of you. So, again, another level of complexity to play the game nowadays. Oh, wow, the uh, cassette version? Because I did. I chose the disc, one, because I could find it, but second, because I could load it faster. All right, so who are these characters again? I forget their names. We're going to need to know their names. It's Eric something and Mavra. I can't remember the names of what they said. There you go. Eric Seablade. Mav, Dormul, and Forstall. Grim. Eric, Mav, and Forstall. Got it. Okay, so there they are. They look exactly like Eric, Mav, and Forstall. Now, where we started the game, the store is obviously in the left if we want to go back into the store. Now that we're at the top level, and there's stairs in the bottom left corner, but you do not use the joystick. I'm wiggling my TI-99 joystick. Nothing happens. Everything is keyboard for controls. So if I want to go downstairs, i got to refer to the manual and know exactly how to go downstairs. It should be function X, descending. So now we're going downstairs. They even have a tune for that one. That's pretty charming, the music for a role-playing game. All right, so now that we're downstairs, we have two different ways we can go left and right. And uh, whenever I first played this, I thought it was openings all around, uh, north, south, east, and west. But no, it is only what you see on the black inner border that you can move on. So if we want to do the movement options, now we use the keys E, D, S, and X to, to move left and right. So if I want to go to the left side, I'm going to go S. And watch what happens. It shifts to first person. And now we're in the maze. And if I want to make my way forward... I walk down to the end of the hall, first person style. Turn around to the other side. Okay, we got a door here. Let's check this one out. Open it up. What in the world? It's two oozes. Okay, so now this is one of the big things about this game. This is one of the first games where the fights are from a, a perspective that you can move all the characters around. So now it's Eric Seablade sword ready. 
he's the uh, blue guy. So if I move him down and his turn's done, and now it's Mauve's turn, and I move Mauve down. She's purple. And then Forstall is outside the battle right now. Move him down. And you're able to control multiple characters in the role-playing game. That's right. Then the Oozes do their turn, and now Seablade does his. I'm going to move down and then attack to the left. I missed. Mauve is going to attack. Boom. Ooze is down with animation. They animated the death and the attacks of the enemies. All right, so four stalls turn. Ooze goes. All right, now it's Eric's. And you can see it's turn-based still, but you're controlling every character on the screen. I don't know if I should touch the chest in the middle. Let's try it. We're going to move them around. Ooze does its turn. Doesn't really do anything. And let's go here. Nope. Can't open the chest. Oh, Mob got in the way. And you can see there's a slight bit of animation whenever the ooze attacks. So I'm going to attack him back. Really, really cool. And one of the first times we've seen this kind of battle system for a role-playing game. Wait, no, go back. I'm mixing the characters up. Forced, I'll go down. Seablade, go, kill. Oh, he's still not dead. Okay, mob go down. Axe ready. Forestall, got it. Ooze attacks, not even close. Down, he's dead. Into the battle. And now, depending on what you got, what does it say? Who's going to open the chest? So you get to pick who's going to open it. And there could be curses inside. There could be bad things that happen. Yeah, that's right. It's like the uh, a, 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 a very rudimentary or a beginning of Ultima that we're playing here. <laughs> yes, right? It's before slimes. Uh, we got this one. All right, let's have uh, Mauve open the chest. And we got 60 gold pieces. Nothing bad there. And a map of the floor. That's what we need. Okay, so now we select the movement option. And you can see it's like we were in the maze. And now it switched to a top-down view of all the characters. And now we can continue moving. Let's go to the left. And now I'm going to hit M. Here's the map. And the map is showing us where we came from down the hall. The stairs are lit up in black and everything every place we've been is black and it's going to continue to tell us now that we got the map too we can now see different um uh, different places and then press back when we're finished you have to push the, the right key on your uh, uh, keyboard anything on this one no that's the room we were in oh there's a scroll though give the scroll to forestall And let's go to the top now. All right, so we walked out. Let's continue down this hallway. And because I want to know where I've been, I'm going to hit M. And you can see we haven't been to past the end of this hallway. So let's go back there, down to the end of the hallway. What is this? Who will use the fountain? Oh, uh, everyone. Forestall. Decreases player damage. Yes, everyone. Drink from the fountain. Mauve, and then Eric, Seablade. I don't know why I like that guy. Oh, and that's the nobody. And then now we move to the left. Yep, going down to the other side. Oh, no, we don't want anyone using the fountain. No, okay, I, drink, drink some more, I guess, fine. All right, now let's move down to the end. It is a swift-moving first-person perspective in the maze. It is a unique battle system. It's got a lot going forward, and we're playing the the base game. Like the, they already gave us uh, people with names, weapons, armor, all that stuff. So it's already you can do a quick game to, to, to jump in and play. All right, so let's see what's this. So now you can see where we are within this hallway. We have another set of stairs. I'm gonna continue on to the right. So let's keep going down here, and then go this way to the right. The only thing that's tricky about playing these games in 1982 on the live stream is I know where I'm going because I'm hitting the correct key. But everybody else, you know, you just see the screen flash. And you're like, okay, where did you go? Which which direction are we headed? But yeah, I can go back to the map. You can see I'm heading down this hallway. I'm going to see what's at the end or the room at the end. Let's go back there and head down, walk into the end of it. Now, when I first was trying to get this to run, what in the world is that? Who will try to open the vault? Combination is three digits, ranging from one to three. Let's try four stall. Combination. Are you supposed to guess? All right, let's do five, five, five. No? I'm trying numbers. Oh, 
Oh, okay. It's only two, three, three. Oh, nice. It's a little mini game of mastermind. All right. So that means one of them is correct. What about three, three, two? No. Okay. Two, three, two. Three, two, three. One. Yes, it is a it is a mini game of Mastermind. No way. That's so cool. Okay, so let's keep going to the right side. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Digits up to one, one to three. It helps to read instructions when you're playing video games. All right, so you can see that we have a compass at the top telling us what direction we're heading in the dungeon. Going down to this side, and I'm going to check my map again. So, yeah, we got a room on the left. I'm going to go back. And then turn to the left. So control wise, this takes a lot to get used to. If um, you wanted to just pick and pick up and play a role playing game, there's other options that are easier to control. But I mean, look what you're getting in for this game. So we got two spiders, Eric C. Blade sword ready. Let's move him up and mob axes ready and forestall. Come on in. Dagger ready. Spiders attack coming in. So so cool that we got an animation of the enemies. That's probably wasn't a good choice, but we'll attack to the left and missed. Uh, everyone's missing. Nobody can hit a spider. Come on. Oh, poisons. Not good. All right. Sea blade attack. Nice. Took out one spider and we'll move forced all over to the side. Spider attacks again. Nice. Got him into the battle. And we found 200 gold pieces and all this. If you make your way back to the stairs at the beginning, you can go back to the, the, the shop, buy more rations and, and supplies and so forth. It's like a dungeon crawler. What do you know? All right, so let's go back out. Only way we came into the room and then turn to the side. Oh, wait, no, that's back where we came. I want to go this way. And then keep going down the hallway. So again, go to the map. Very first video game that is auto mapping the map. Uh, we picked up a map and it's showing us where we've been or what we've seen and then where we need to go. We know everything in blue is what we haven't seen yet. So we're going to check out the room at the end of the hallway down there. Let's go. Really cool that I was able to show you this one because uh, it took me a while to figure out uh, Wizardry and Ultima to load characters or create characters. And this one's similar, but I would say this is even more difficult and you have to have a lot more hardware to play this one. So your turn, Eric Seablade. Sword ready. Let's have him go to the right. And he's ready. Missed. Mav. Hit him with the axe. Nice. And then Forstall. Get in there. He's hanging on the outside because he's been to be a wizard. And then Eric Seablade. Attack north. Nice. And... Oh, Mav. What in the world? I should have had you move. Okay, Forstall. Just go back there. Spider attacks. Uh, Eric Seablade's where it's at. Seablade's got it. And they're giving you all the stats on the top right. Uh, HP... And, um, okay, so into the battle, 120 gold pieces, nice. And now we can move back out that direction going south. So I'm going to see again, go to the map, and we're back where we were on this part. And then this is just the first dungeon, and you can see the, the stairs we came out are on the right side. And then if you want to go further down to the next level, they're all the way over on the far left to go down to the fl floor two. All right, so that is Tunnels of Doom. Now, I'd love to hear from the chat because uh, we played role-playing games. I gave uh, Ultima and Wizardry five stars, the, 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 be, one of the best games you could play at the time. Is Tunnels of Doom one of the best games you could play, or is it a little bit too cumbersome because of, of control-wise? I would say the uh, graphics and the first-person perspective and the auto-mapping feature Plus, the, we did the auto like game that was built in, so we didn't really choose weapons, armor, and so forth. But there's a lot more options for the role-playing uh, game that the person that we want to play. Th th this is the best role-playing game you could play on the Texas Instruments home computer. But we're considering all the home computers. Is this one of the best games you could play on all the home computers for everything we've seen to this point? Oh, four and a half, yes. Yeah, okay, so I'm with you on that. Uh, I'm not going to go five because I still see, um, uh, because of the scenarios and how it gets expanded upon more with Wizardry and Ultima, I would say those are five. So we're going to have four and a half stars for Tunnels of Doom. Still one of the best games you could play in 1982. And after that, let's see where we're going now. From one computer to another, the Commodore VIC-20 has Computer Adventure. 
This is another one without a box. Let's pop it and play Computer Adventure by Bruce Robinson. This was a two-parter of adventure games by Victory Software. Let's see what Bruce Robinson has. I'm at home, and I see a sugar bowl, phone, and wall switch, and broad... What is that? Broad spoon? All right, how about we get bowl? Okay, got it. Get phone? Oh, I can't get the phone. Of course not. What about get... Wait, is that broad sword? I can't do that. Okay, I don't know what that is. All right, uh... Uh, use switch. Uh, you can't. You wait. No, I can't use the switch. Let me look again. Broad str. I don't know what that is. So we're playing a. Uh, I guess you could say uh, a really cheap text adventure game because it's in a bundle of two, and so I'm wondering if can we even move around? Let's see. Can we go north? No. Still at home. South. East. West. Okay, try go west. Can I go? I can I go anywhere? I don't think I can go anywhere. Use wall. Can't you? What? It's just repeating the same thing over and over. It's not even telling me if it's right or not. So we got a bowl. Uh, eat bowl. Nothing responds. So this one isn't even saying you got it wrong or you typed it wrong or try again. It just repeats the same thing. So that's not very helpful. Uh, what about look bowl? Oh gosh, no. Oh my gosh, inventory? Okay, sh okay, inventory to work. Help. Nothing with help. Uh, info. Uh, no, info is the same as inventory, it looks like. Oh man, flip that switch. Nothing. Gosh, doesn't even respond at all. What about, uh, answer... Phone. We'll just pretend it's ring. No. We have a phone, a wall strip, a switch. Okay, so uh, this is another adventure game that we could not find the walkthrough for. And we're going to probably see lots of those because this one was a package of two adventure games. Probably rushed out to get something that people could play. This is the 80s experience, though, with adventure games. Just continue to type in whatever you can to see what would happen. But, yeah. At least they weren't as bad as playing on the Texas Instruments home computer. So for computer adventure, uh, it's a bad experience. I'm going to say two stars for computer adventure. If I spend enough time, like a week, playing this one, I'm sure I'd figure out the commands and be able to type the next one. But that's not all. It's a two-parter. And the other part is Moon Base Alpha for the Commodore VIC-20. So if you didn't like computer adventure, maybe you'll like Moon Base Alpha. Let's pop in and play another one by Bruce Robinson, published by Victory Software. Is this one just as bargain bin as the other one? I'm in the control room. I can see a computer with lock computer. I can go to the silo, biolab. The comet is 31,000 miles away. We have a door with a lock. Unlock door. Huh? The comet's few... Okay, yeah, I'm going to repeat the same thing, right? Okay, so I can go to the silo. Go silo? Huh? I'm in the silo. Okay, so this one doesn't... This kind of shows you the rudimentaryness of other text adventure games. When you play games like Zork, you have a world, like multi areas you can go and explore in different places, and it feels almost like an actual world you're you're navigating in. This one, and possibly the other one we played, there isn't really movement. You know, you're like in one room and you make decisions and type those in. It kind of shows the simplicity. <laughs> yeah, what's the year? Start date 1999. I'm really excited for that, by the way. Playing video games where they tell you the future is the end in 1997 or the apocalypse happens and it's 1992. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited when we see that. All right, so we got chisel, detonator, get chisel. Got it, get missile. We can get detonator. And I'm not really sure what a gantry is, but we're going to get it. I can't do that. Okay, we can't. All right, so we can go to the control room. In the control room... Oh, we can go bio lab. Go bio. I'm in the bio lab. I see rocks, gloves, petri disc, autoclave. I can go to the control room. Okay, so this is a different kind of text adventure game, but we've already seen a few of these. This one is not necessarily where you're picking up treasure and coming back for score. You're going to be 
solving puzzles, almost like it's just puzzle focused. You're in the room. Uh, think of like uh, one of the rooms in Mist. That's what the entire game is. And you're just supposed to figure out the puzzle and, and, and work it out to, to finish the game. That's essentially what this is. This is the, it looks like a comet is coming toward us. So we have to, a certain amount of time before the comet actually attacks and we stop the comet. And that's the whole point of this game. But uh, you can see how sm small of scope it is compared to the other ones. It's better than computer adventure. Then I, I'll give it that, but I'll still say, uh, I'll say subpar. Two and a half stars for Moon Base Alpha. It's got something going for it, just not really enough to push it over the edge. All right, so that was where we're going to put our video game playing on pause this evening. Lots more to see. Again, we got two big ones that are coming up. They're going to be some of the best in 1982 very shortly. Uh, we're going to be playing uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, if you could go back to 1982, what would you say and how would you rate these games? If you knew nothing else, let's let's clear our minds and forget about everything we know about video games now and just think of right now, what would you rate these games on our five-star scale? Well, that's it for today. And like I always say, if you're going to play a text adventure game, be sure to put in some thought on what you're going to type in first. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.